So I want to do something a little bit different today. I want to talk about five books that really inspired me as a social scientist and changed the way that I think about the possibilities of anthropology and sociology as fields of knowledge. Now, these are all ethnographies, books that study human culture and experiences from a qualitative scientific perspective using ethnographic methods. And these are not necessarily the best or most influential ethnographies ever written. Some of them actually are, to be fair, but after giving it some thought, these are my five favorite ethnographies that I would recommend to students today. The first item on my list is Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies, Migrant Farm Workers in the United States, written by Seth Holmes. This is an incredibly powerful, and I mean visceral, piece of writing. The author spent years living and working with basically the poorest class of migrant workers as a migrant worker himself. He traveled illegally from southern Mexico to the U.S., worked grueling jobs as a fruit picker in California and Washington State, and then traveled back across the border to Mexico more than once. And he details every aspect of migrant labor, not just as an observer, but as someone who's going through it themselves and feeling their body and sense of self be transformed by the experience. It is genuinely one of the best examples of participant observation that I've ever read, and it would be valuable for that on its own, but Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies is so much more than a case study in research methods. Migrant workers in the produce industry are people that we're connected to every time we buy fresh supermarket produce, but those connections are obscured intentionally by corporate interests in the food industry and caught in a web of marketing and distribution that's impossible for your average consumer to conceptualize when they're just grabbing items off of a shelf. And what Holmes does is humanize these people and study the conditions of their labor, not in terms of personal choice, but in terms of the social and economic systems that compel them to make the choices that they do, to seek out this brutal and often dehumanizing form of manual labor. So as you travel with these people, uh, the web that obscures your relationship to them as a consumer kind of starts to unravel, and you better understand how your perspective of some forms of labor and of workers themselves can be completely distorted by political narratives and marketing campaigns. Now, one additional aspect of this book and a reason that I would recommend it is that Seth Holmes is just a really good writer. He avoids a lot of academic jargon and presents academic theory in an accessible way for new readers, and that makes this a very good entry point into ethnography itself. And honestly, something that I would recommend to readers on either side of the political aisle, understanding who these people actually are and why they make the choices they make can only serve to strengthen your understanding of a very complex phenomenon in modern labor. The next book on the list is Veiled Sentiments, Honor and Poetry in Bedouin Society, written by Laila Abu Lughod. This is a kind of early postmodern ethnographic study of a Bedouin community located in Western Egypt in the late 1970s. And I'll get back to what I mean by early postmodernism in just a second. But on a surface level, the book focuses on some pretty standard themes that you'll see across a lot of ethnographic writing. But when you dig a little bit deeper, what's unique about this, and what I love about Veiled Sentiments, is the author's exploration of oral poetry. In addition to a pretty standard ethnographic commentary, Abu Lukot also studies these fascinating lyrical poems that are sung almost exclusively by Bedouin women. And the poetry has some pretty radical themes. It focuses on things like women's sorrow and loss, their anger at their dependency on their husbands, or longing for romantic love while trapped in loveless traditional marriages, all things that they could never express publicly in any other form. Now, Abu Lukhod is also a feminist author, and using a feminist lens, it would be very easy to interpret these poems as being a radical or subversive form of resistance to this male-dominated society, and she's actually quite open about feeling that impulse as a researcher and the ways in which her political perspective might impact her impressions of the Bedouin. The thing is, over time, observing Bedouin women and trying to understand their unique perspective, she begins to realize that this form of oral poetry 
is actually not that radical at all. Her data suggests that it's part of a traditional, culturally sanctioned form of artistic expression that ultimately serves to reinforce the patriarchal structure of Bedouin society rather than challenge it. And that becomes one of the core observations of the book. And this is something that the author is actually very good at. She reflexively explores her own biases as she conducts research and is able to communicate that in a really lucid and readable way in her books. And that's a quality that we typically ascribe to postmodern ethnography, sort of building self-reflection into the text. And I think that this is one of the best early postmodern ethnographies ever written. The third book on my list is Yero Tapakan Balinese Healer, written by Linda Connor and Patsy and Timothy Ash. And I can guarantee that this is not going to be on anyone else's list of favorite anthropology books. It's had very little impact on the discipline, but it's part of a movement in visual anthropology that I think has enormous untapped potential and I would love to see resurrected in some capacity today. So what this is, is an ethnographic film monograph. There was a time from the mid-1970s through the late 80s when visual anthropologists who made and released ethnographic films began to publish books that were meant to be read as a supplement to their movies. And that's a very good idea because in a lot of observational ethnographic filmmaking, the audience is basically just dropped into a wildly different cultural setting without very much context. As a viewer, you just sort of like soak in the environment as though you were there experiencing it in reality, but you don't necessarily learn very much. And that's where these books came in. They provided a lot of ethnographic information that puts each scene in a cultural and historical context. And Good ethnographic film monographs like Yero Tapakan also include a kind of reflexive commentary on the filmmaking process itself. They talk a lot about where they position the camera and why, what they choose to film or not film, that kind of thing. And what this does is help you as a reader and viewer understand the filmmaker's research biases and see how those biases are reflected on both the screen and in their ethnographic writing. It's basically an academic version of a director's commentary and a behind-the-scenes featurette all rolled into one that's designed to teach you about a culture. It's very cool. Now, this isn't really a book that I would recommend to students if you're not interested in visual anthropology or visual culture, but if you're ever interested in using film or photography as a supplement to your research, then watching ethnographic films and reading ethnographic film monographs will help you understand and articulate your own research biases and teach you ways to mitigate those, to limit their influence on your data collection, and to systematically articulate them to your audience so that they understand your orientation as a qualitative researcher. And if that's something that interests you, then Yero Tapakan and its associated films, which I'll link in the video description, are some of the best materials that I could possibly recommend. The fourth item on the list is A Death in the Rainforest, How a Language and a Way of Life Came to an End in Papua New Guinea, written by Don Kulik. This is simultaneously an ethnographic study and a kind of memoir that basically summarizes three decades of fieldwork and the ways in which that research changed the author's life. In a sense, it reminds me of another book, Tris Tropique by Claude Lévi-Strauss, which is a classic canonical text from the 1950s and also very much worth reading. Now, at its core, A Death in the Rainforest is basically a work of linguistic anthropology. Back in the 1980s, Don Kulik started living in Gapun, this tiny village of about 200 people in the jungles of New Guinea. And at the time, Gapun had been almost entirely cut off from the outside world, but was just beginning to be influenced by broader Papuan society and the arrival of Western products and media. And part of that was that their native language, Tayap, was beginning to die out. And Kulik, being a good linguistic anthropologist, was interested in the process of language death. And over the course of the next three decades, he continued returning to Gapun to study how the Tayap language was changing and being replaced by Tok Pisin, which is a kind of Creole language and is one of the official languages of New Guinea. The thing is, Languages don't just die out all at once. If you've watched some of my other videos, you'll know that language is an integral part of culture, and language death is often a symptom of a broader, systemic cultural change that can take place over the course of generations. So 
in studying the death of the Tayyap language, the author is pulled into studying every aspect of life in this small village and its relationship to the surrounding jungle, all through the lens, through the prism of linguistic anthropology. And the result is a really good ethnographic commentary on cultural change and a very human reflection on loss, how the combined influence of things like religious conversion, neoliberal business investment, and environmental degradation and exploitation can affect human beings so systemically that it literally changes the way that we speak, which also affects the way that we understand and represent the world around us. In one particularly sad chapter, for example, Don Kulik asks villagers what the tie-up word for rainbow is, and no one in the village can remember anymore. And that sentiment of loss in the face of inexorable cultural change is kind of the thread that holds the whole ethnography together. It's a very well-written and highly accessible book as well, and something that I would recommend to any student in social science. This will also give you a pretty good impression of what it's like to do ethnographic research in one of the most extreme and physically demanding environments that I can possibly imagine. So, highly recommended. The fifth book on the list for today is Direct Action and Ethnography, written by the late, great David Graeber. And this might be a controversial choice for some people, but I don't think it should be, and I'm going to explain why. But first, on a surface level, Direct Action is essentially an ethnographic study of a North American anarchist community that focuses on the process of self-organization and the way that anarchist groups actually prepare for and engage in direct political action and civil disobedience. Now, this is also a gigantic book. It's physically intimidating to read, which is a definite downside. The first 200 pages or so are basically a detailed ethnographic study of what you might call leftist consensus building. You sit through seemingly endless meetings between different collectives and members of direct action networks as they try to hash out the minute details of a protest that they're planning in the summer of 2001. And I've seen people criticize the book for being overly long and repetitive, but I think that there's a kind of performative aspect to the writing here. The length and repetitiveness of his ethnography actually is the point. If you've ever spent time in anarchist communities attempting to practice direct democracy, that's what it feels like sometimes. And for Graeber, and this is something that he talks about in later sections of the book, the revolutionary promise that he sees in anarchism is not so much what happens in the streets, but what happens in the meetings. Direct democracy and the construction of grassroots local coalitions through political consensus for many of the people that he meets in interviews is already revolutionary. That's the kind of theoretical thread that holds the second half of the book together, which is admittedly less ethnographic and more expressly political. Now, despite its length, at its core, this is still a highly readable book, and I would recommend it to anyone interested in autoethnography as a method or an activist anthropology. Wherever you are on the political spectrum, right, left, or center, Direct Action provides a really rare window into the internal politics and organizational practices of a political movement that's very poorly understood in popular discourse, and the author has an almost conversational style that once you get used to it makes that world much more accessible and comprehensible. It's just really good stuff. So there you have it. I talked for a little bit longer than I intended, but five ethnographies that I really admire that in one way or another have shaped how I think about the possibilities of social science as an anthropologist myself. Now, some of these I read a bit too late in my career, others I read too early and failed to appreciate until much later. But these are all things that I would recommend to students getting started in anthropology today. And they're definitely things that you should at least be aware of if you're interested in qualitative social science. I'll provide some references and an expanded reading list below in the video description. But if you're interested in a full reading list with a discussion of major authors and texts, you can come on over to our Patreon where we post reading lists, scripts, study guides, and other content. And if you like what we're doing on the channel, you can consider supporting us to become one of these great patrons of independent social science education. Thank you all very much for your support. You rock, and you at home, thank you for watching. Whoever you are, whatever you do, I hope you never stop learning.